So once again, I want to welcome everybody uh, to today's program, uh, Artistic Insights with LF Tantillo. This is the second of monthly talks that we'll, we will be hosting uh, with Len for the exhibition, A Sense of Time, the Historical Art of LF Tantillo, which is on display at the Albany Institute uh, into June of 2021. My name is Patrick Stenshorn. I am the Director of Interpretive Programs at the Albany Institute. And once again, I would like to also introduce uh, Victoria Waldron, who is uh, also on this call from the Albany Institute. She is the museum's education assistant. She is under the name Albany Institute of History and Art Education. If you should have any technical issues during today's program, please send Victoria a message in the chat box and she will be able to uh, help address any of those issues for you. For today's presentation, uh, please double check to make sure that your microphone is on mute. Uh, the presentation has been pre-recorded, so we will be watching the video through a shared screen through my account here. Um, if you are on a device that has a webcam on it, please feel free to have that turned on or off, whatever is most comfortable for you. At the end of the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session uh, with LF Tantillo using the chat function on Zoom. So if you have a question at the end of today's presentation, please feel free to type it in the chat box and we will be able to, uh, Len will either be able to read the questions or I will be able to read them uh, to him to address. I know many of you do know Len uh, through uh, many different areas, family, uh, through his art and other uh, areas as well. But just, uh, I want, would like to also give a brief background on him before we get started. Um, Len is a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, he is a licensed architect who left the field of architecture to pursue a career in, in fine art of historical and marine painting. Since that time, his work has appeared internationally in exhi exhibitions, publications, and film documentaries. He is a fellow of the American Society of Marine Artists. His work is included in the collections of the Fenimore Art Museum, the Minnesota Museum of Marine Art, the Albany Institute of History and Art, numerous historical societies, corporate and private collections in the United States and abroad. He has produced hundreds of paintings and drawings of New York State history. And in 2016, he was elected a fellow of the New York Academy of History. So without further ado, I will begin playing the video uh, of today's presentation. At the conclusion of the video, we will then conduct a question and answer session. So I hope everybody enjoys. Welcome to the second part of a video series um, that's being made to accompany the exhibition at the Albany Institute of History and, and Art, A Sense of Time, The Historical Paintings of L.F. Tantillo. Uh, my name is Len Tantillo. Uh, part two is going to focus on the Indians, the Dutch, and the end of an era. Migration into North America took place 10 to 20,000 years ago. Um, historians believe that the greater influx probably came from Asia, but that there is a possibility that Europeans uh, migrated to North America as well. Over the course of the centuries, the populations uh, spread out um, and they started to form tribal groups. In New York State, there were primarily two different groups of Indians. The, uh, those who spoke the Iroquoian language and were part of the Iroquois uh, Confederacy and uh, Algonquian speaking people. The Algonquian people were mostly uh, on the eastern side of the Hudson River and kind of out into what is today Connecticut and Massachusetts. The tribes, uh, the Iroquois tribes, were there were five of them to start with, the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and the Mohawks. And the Algonquians were Mohican, Asopus, Munsee, Wappingers, and Lenape. The uh, 
colors that I've used kind of to tint this map, the blue and the orange, it's really meant to give you a sense that there are no hard boundaries between these groups. They were in a kind of a constant state of flux. There was movement. Um, there were conflicts between uh, the Iroquois and the Algonquian speakers. Um, but um, there was also uh, uh, the Algonquian people did have uh, an alliance, not as formal as the alliance of the Iroquois, but an alliance nonetheless that provided opportunities for trade. One of the things that all the native people had in common um, was that they lived in a natural environment and they relied on the natural resources for their survival, all of them. The forests provided uh, wood that they could use for building shelters, for making utensils, uh, for producing um, all, all manner of the necessity, necessities um, of uh, a life. Um, they were, the, their food supply came from wildlife and crops that they grew. And all of these elements together, and this is pretty universal among all the tribes, all these elements had a spiritual quality and it influenced their cultural um, practices. Um, and I, it was that uh, they were pretty much a part of their natural environment in all aspects of their lives. This is a 17th century watercolor that depicts Algonquian people fishing. Uh, they're in a dugout canoe and you can see a fish weir up here in the corner and this kind of an interesting variety of uh, fish that they're trying to capture with spears or trapping or uh, netting. Um, this, uh, this particular image really influenced a painting that I did about a year ago, uh, this one, which depicts a Muncie fisherman uh, in the Wallkill River in what is today New Paltz, New York, in a time long before the arrival of Europeans, maybe somewhere in the 14 or 1500s. And we know that, um, that uh, the Muncie and other tribes in New York State, um, especially the, the river Indians, captured all kinds of fish. Um, and one of them was a, were sturgeon. And for people who don't know what a sturgeon looks like, it's a quite prehistoric looking fish and they get to be enormous, sometimes as long as 10 or 12 feet. Uh, this group has managed to capture a sturgeon of about 250 to 300 pounds. And it's probably taken most of a day to uh, manage to land it. Uh, the Indians of the Northeast did not have horses. They never had horses. Um, they relied on, on uh, cross-country journeys, difficult cross-country journeys, but when they were, when uh, a, a distance needed to be covered, they used the waterways. And the principal waterways in the Northeast are these three to three and a half river systems. There's the Connecticut River, the Hudson River, the Delaware River, and the Mohawk River. And traveling on those waterways, the Algonquian people um, made a vessel um, from a hollowed out log uh, called a dugout canoe. And they would use fire and scrape away using shells to kind of create the inner part of, uh, of the hull. We know that these were made and, and used prolifically because we see it in the icons uh, that the Dutch use uh, as decorations for their maps. The Iroquois people made their canoes out of bark. And this is a wonderful watercolor from um, uh, the late 1600s. Uh, these are uh, birch bark canoes and canoes made out of other woods. The one that interested me the most was the Mohawk canoe canoe, which is uh, made from elm bark. 
Elm is a pretty difficult wood to work with, no matter what you're doing with it. So they were somewhat crude. Um, the uh, bark is not at all flexible, so they're sort of uh, very uh, rigid in, in terms of their uh, design. And I've used uh, elm bark canoes in a number of paintings depicting uh, Mohawks. Uh, this particular scene is set on a lake in western New York. This is a fascinating place. Um, this is a great example of how the Mohawks lived, how they organized their lives, how they organized their communities. And it's a site that can be visited to this day. It's a very short distance from Fonda, New York. It's uh, pronounced uh, Kona, Konawaga. Um, and um, archeologists, after discovering the post molds of the delineation of these houses, staked them out on the ground so that when you're visiting this site, you actually walk among the longhouses and you can walk around the perimeter of this community. And uh, this wonderful uh, aerial view of it from uh, Google Maps gives you a sense of the caretakers have obviously mowed the grass uh, differently from uh, the area that is inscribed by the post molds so that from above you can see actually how those long houses are arranged in the countryside. Indian structures, whether they're wigwams or long houses, took advantage of the, um, the arch shape. Um, wigwams and long houses are consistently built this way. The arch is very strong and can resist uh, very heavy loads. In, in the case of the Northeast, that would be snow loads. Um, rain, rain would easily drain away on a surface that's shaped like that. And there's an aerodynamic quality to it. So wind would be no issue whatsoever. Uh, the loading would be dispersed. Um, right around uh, the curvature of the structure. The inside was flexible. You could make it as wide or as tall as it needed to be to accommodate your family or your, and your needs. And the structures were light, so they didn't require um, a foundation. So we see this shape over and over again. Greg Sorwhitey is an archaeologist in Western New York, and he has spent many, many, many years investigating Onondaga sites. Uh, this is one of many drawings made by Greg. This is a plan of post molds that he found of an Onondaga house, uh, which was sited very near the stockade uh, fence that went all the way around the community. You can see the post molds sort of define the shape of the main house. They also define a lean-to structure of some sort on the side. And you can see pretty clearly the shape of the, um, the stockade that surrounded the village. The corner is of particular interest, this, this uh, diamond shape in here. That's... Um, this village would have been constructed after contact with Europeans. And um, that corner bastion is something we'll be taking a harder look at in a few minutes. Uh, this is a schematic digital model that I built uh, showing the relationship of the lean-to to the uh, main house, the arched uh, longhouse. And this is a drawing that I made, a conjectural drawing of what this uh, structure might have looked like. I'm also building a digital model of the site, um, and I had started with this particular corner. So in the digital model, you can see the, the long house and the structure leaning uh, alongside. 
And you can see the density of the stockade. Um, it's also referred to as a palisade. Um, it's, this particular model is not finished yet. I, there's still some elements that I need to add to complete it. Um, during the later half of the 17th century, um, the French diagrammed an Onondaga site. Uh, this is a schematic plan that they made of the layout of the community. And it's fairly rigid and um, simplified. Um, they've just shown it as a rectangle with a number of dwellings inside. And the problem with using this in any kind of realistic way is that if you project that uh, that layout, uh, you get something that's just hard geometry. It doesn't relate to the real world. So one of the challenges that I had was to take this and reconfigure it to fit into a landscape. That would be taking into account things like hills and gullies um, and drainage. And you can also see very clearly the, the uh, corner structures, those corner bastions, and um, uh, I think it's curious when you compare those to what you find in Albany in the 1690s, uh, this uh, pen and ink drawing, and the, this painting that I made for a historic site in Kingston, uh, showing Kingston in the 1690s, and there they are, those corner bastions. Very, very similar. Buildings made of lightweight wooden material, um, have a great disadvantage. With all the advantages that they have, a spark can bring on a disaster. And there's a, a record of a fire that started in an Onondaga community that was whipped up by the wind and wound up destroying the entire community. The Mohicans uh, lived quite differently uh, than the Mohawks. The, the Mohicans um, built smaller structures called wigwams. Um, you can see the post molds here. This is a diagram that was made by Lucianne Lavin and a number of other archaeologists in the 1990s. Um, these are the post molds and char pits that they found during their dig. Um, the oval structure here is uh, sometimes referred to as a we too. From this diagram, um, and also some information about the site, I made this painting. This is uh, a pap pap the Papskenny site, um, and you can see the, uh, the wigwam here and the we too. You can also see where their crops are grown, corn and beans and squash. And the Papskinny Creek here in the background, you can also make out um, in the distance there um, a fish weir. I think it's important at this point to point out that uh, I'm not an Indian, I'm not Dutch, and I'm not English, but I am an upstate New Yorker, and I am a grandfather. And so when I approach these native subjects, um, I try to find um, the uh, human aspects of their lives that uh, would be similar to things that I would know. And so that's the kind of thing that I bring to paintings like this one of uh, a Mohican elder uh, telling a story to a bunch of uh, younger uh, villagers. Uh, this is a painting that's set in Castleton, New York. That's the Hudson River in the background. And uh, the idea here is that um, this is how the history was passed on. Um, it, was, it, was, it was not written, history was oral. And the grandfather who's telling this story is animating that in such a way that he is entertaining um, um, all his listeners. Kind of in the same way, um, doing this scene, living up here, it's cold in the winter. It's, we have weather that's 20 degrees below zero. We have snowfalls that are 
in excess of three feet. Um, winters are long. Um, we can have sub-zero temperatures for a week or two or a month. So what I'm trying to show in this painting is winter and uh, surviving in winter. Uh, this is a Mohawk site, uh, not far from the town of Kanajahari, New York. The Mohawk River is in the background and two hunters are returning to their community. Uh, they've had a successful hunt. One of them has a turkey on his back. And I'm trying to express that feeling of freezing cold temperatures and returning to the warmth of community. Well, things were different in Europe. Um, while all that was going on in North America, a very small country, European country, the Netherlands, um, had become a world sea power. They had a powerful navy, they had a powerful merchant ship, and they were trading everywhere on the globe. Uh, the Netherlands was, had a far superior fleet uh, than the English, or the Spanish, you know, the famous Spanish Armada was nothing compared to the, the Dutch fleet. And here you have this tiny little country with so much power. And I think to illustrate that point, if you take a look at the United States um, and you take a look at New York State, you can take the entire country of the Netherlands and fit it inside New York a country that had that much power and that much influence 400 years ago was so small. In 1609, uh, the Dutch arrive and things begin to change here. They hire uh, an English explorer, Henry Hudson. Uh, he's given a Dutch ship, the Half Moon, the Habe Man, and Hudson sets out on a journey to see if he can find a route uh, to the Orient through a continent uh, that very little is known about. So um, Hudson sails into this wilderness. Um, he realizes the further north he goes in this river, which now carries his name, the Hudson River, that he is not going to find what he originally set out to, but that what he discovers along the way are tribal groups some friendly, some not friendly, but for the most part willing to trade. And he takes that information with him back to Europe. And what follows by 1614 is Adrian Bloch, Hendrik Christensen, and a number of other uh, Dutch uh, entrepreneurial traders who are trying to map out and calculate where the most advantageous places would be to trade. Uh, Block and Christensen are both interested in the upper Hudson River. This is uh, Block's map uh, directing people uh, through the uh, Hudson River system. And at the headwaters of the Hudson on an island near Albany, they build a small trading fort uh, called Fort Nassau. 30 years ago, I made this painting of uh, Fort Nassau. I didn't really know that much about it at the time. The map gave uh, some dimensional uh, information about the building and the wall that surrounded it. And so in this kind of misty background, I portrayed Christensen's ship and uh, what at the time I thought the fort may have looked like. Well, since then I've had an opportunity to revisit it a few times. One of the first things I tried to figure out is realistically, what kind of building would they have been able to make? Uh, the Dutch were already using a, a, a framing system, an H framing system in barns and houses, and they were proficient at that. So I started with an H frame on this particular uh, iteration of it has a side aisle uh, the main beams and columns are rough hewn from lumber that they would have found easily uh, near the site of the fort. There are saplings uh, that are being used for the roof and the infill is clay and reed. 
Uh, this is a digital model of the, the site. And you can see in the model that I've changed my mind about this building being surrounded by a rectilinear uh, palisade. It seems to me that uh, when you read about the weapons that they used, the cannons, swivel guns that they had, uh, and the maps that Block left behind, that it may have had two bastions on the corners. So if you if if this is more realistic, and you can also see in this uh, elevated view, you can see that there's a moat around it. And then the eye level view would be more like that. Simple building, thatch roof, sapling uh, stockade surrounding it. In um, 1621, the Dutch formed the Dutch West India Company. And basically, that was an outgrowth of trying to organize trade in the New World. The, uh, from the era of uh, Bloch and Christensen, there was a lot of competition going on between investors who were sending ships uh, to the Hudson Valley, uh, so much so that they started to fight with each other. After the formation of the Dutch West India Company, the company itself took over control of trade. Um, New Netherland was a very well organized colony. Uh, I think the best way to kind of get a sense of how it worked is that um, when you look at that territory, now we looked at this map a little earlier. One of the things the Dutch realized very early on were those same rivers that the Native Americans were using for uh, travel, the Hudson, the Connecticut, the Mohawk, and the Delaware, would be a great advantage for them in trading with the people who lived here. The kind of, that sort of rubber band shape that I'm indicating uh, New Netherland with, I, I kind of use, I, was, I always think of that as a real rubber band because the edges of New Netherland were constantly changing and being shaped by forces around it, which you'll see in a few minutes. But using those three rivers, um, they built a series of forts. Uh, Fort Nassau was up here, which eventually becomes Fort Orange. Uh, Good Hope, which is really just a house with a wall around it. And on the Delaware River, Fort Casimir. The hub, the center, the heart of New Netherland was Manhattan. The furs were scattered. Um, there were the most, probably the most productive area for beaver fur was Western New York, but beaver were also caught on the Connecticut River and near the Delaware River. That was the reason for these forts being there. The forts, the furs would be gathered at the forts, they'd be shipped to Manhattan, and then from Manhattan they would be shipped to Europe. The reason why furs were so valuable uh, in the early part of the 17th century was the hat industry. Hats were made from beaver fur. Um, the felt was processed in very caustic tanks filled with um, nitrate of mercury, a uh, highly poisonous material. Um, if you've ever heard the expression mad as a hatter, it's because people in the hat business were poisoned by that mercury. In 1624, they build, uh, the, the, the company builds a uh, permanent uh, trading fort, Fort Orange. This is a map of uh, Rensselaerswick. This is the upper Hudson uh, where Albany is today. This was drawn in the 1630s. And there are a lot of great details on this map. For instance, if you sort of focus in on this area, you can see, uh, uh, an indication of Fort Orange. And, and in the indication, you can see that it has corner bastions and it 
that that sort of lighter line around the outer edge of it is is the uh, moat. And from this and other maps and other data and descriptions, um, I made this painting almost 30 years ago. And um, this is the first time I painted Fort Orange. And I was really basing it on what I had read. And at that time, uh, um, the information that I could, I could get from a, a network of very, very talented historians. I'm not a historian myself. I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. And so my contact with historians has been uh, the backbone of uh, the process of creating these uh, historical images. Well, over the course of time, my ideas about this fort have changed because of information that's been presented, some of it new, some of it from the documents. And so this is the most recent painting that I've made of Fort Orange, and this is a few years ago now. But the fort is a little bit smaller, a little bit cruder. Um, uh, the design of the moat is a little bit different. It's, it's a little closer to what I think was, was actually built. This is another painting. The fort's very small, but it's in the background. And this is the arrival of the Gelderzee Bloom, a Dutch merchant ship um, that was uh, it brought uh, immigrants and uh, supplies to the to the New World. Now, ships this large would be uncommon in the Upper Hudson River, but we know that this one did come. This is a relatively large painting. On the opposite side of the river, so we were just looking at Fort Orange, the location of Fort Orange, over here on the eastern uh, shore of the Hudson. There was a farm called uh, the Leitzberg, and I was fascinated by that cartouche because in studying old paintings and prints of the Netherlands, um, I saw structures similar to this. Um, there's a, some kind of a silo or a tower there. There's a hay barrack here. Uh, the buildings are all connected. Um, so from that, I made this conjectural uh, painting of possibly what that might have represented. Tall st structures like this were sometimes used for drying herbs or uh, other uh, uh, crops. Um, early on in the formation of the colony, uh, some of the settlers tried to grow tobacco and a structure like that could be used to dry tobacco leaves. There were a number of people who lived uh, in the fort who uh, had decided that um, it was too restrictive, um, so they ventured out. And there were some 20-year-old um, uh, uh, settlers who ventured south on the Hudson River, south of the fort, five, 10 miles, and also north of the fort. Uh, this is a Dutch farmstead uh, on the Papskinney Creek, um, or probably around the 1640s or 1650s. You can see the hay barrack uh, there in the background. Hay barracks are interesting structures. Uh, basically, they're a mobile roof on top of a set of poles. This roof part can be moved up or down depending on how much hay is inside this structure. And hay barracks were common in uh, the Netherlands. And they provided, they also provided shelter for uh, livestock in the winter months, the cold winter months. Um, some of these were built up on platforms so that animals could actually get under the hay and the fermenting hay produced heat. This is the uh, Dutch uh, merchant vessel called a bark. It was owned by um, Adrian van der Donk. Um, and uh, when he decided to venture out of the fort, he went north. And he had permission to construct a farmstead on the uh, western shore of the Hudson River. And he lived pretty much on the edge of Mohawk territory. And in this painting, uh, 
you see these Mohawk Mohawks making their way out in their elm bark canoes to investigate this uh, newcomer. Um, you may be able to notice that on the deck of the bark are some horses. They would have been very curious about the livestock that the Dutch were bringing with them. They never traded for those animals, but they were curious about those animals. Van Curler's farmstead uh, began with a kind of a primitive structure that, that he and his family lived in and his workers for a time here. In this painting, you can also see he has a hay barrack right there. And then later he built this long building. Um, it's a, a house barn, a Dutch house barn. It's not really unlike uh, the Mohawk longhouse. Um, they weren't, often they weren't partitioned off. The family lived at one end of the building and the livestock lived at the other. And there are some Dutch paintings that show people sitting around a table, taking part in an evening meal with cows standing around them. An incident took place at uh, Van Curler's farm, kind of a very well documented and interesting incident involving a Jesuit priest who had been uh, living in Canada uh, and, uh, and northern New York, preaching to the Mohawks. And uh, um, the Mohawks weren't very receptive to the Jesuit. And at one point he had been captured and tortured and was being taken by a band of Mohawks to Fort Orange to be ransomed. The Mohawks knew uh, Van Curler and they had been trading with Van Curler and uh, sometimes using his uh, house barn for shelter. And uh, that was the case when they were making their way south with their captive, the priest. And uh, they asked Van Curler if they could spend the night in his, uh, his house barn and he agreed. He could see that their captive was in pretty bad shape he felt sorry for him, and somehow, it's not really known, in the night, um, he was able to uh, get the priest away from the Mohawks and um, sheltered for a time um, and taken to Fort Orange, where he was kept until there was a vessel uh, available, and then the Jesuit was uh, transported downriver and then back to Europe. The reason why I bring this up is because uh, this painting is called Departure of the Jesuit, and you can see he's being helped by the Dutch. There's the priest inside the shed. Uh, this is the domini, uh, the, the uh, minister to the, of the uh, Dutch community, and they're about to take him out to this vessel in the river. Um, the Jesuit was an educated man. He was articulate. He was a good writer. And during his period of several months in uh, Rensselaerswick, he made note of what he saw. He described the fort, he described the houses, and I've used those writings over time to depict scenes from uh, Rensselaerswick. He describes this farm and he describes the fort. Now, I don't know whether this is what he's describing, but to me, this sort of meets uh, the requirements of what he's trying to tell us. Um, I also work on, um, on uh, many, many types of, uh, of ships, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. And uh, what I look for are documents that can help me to visualize what they are. Uh, the two drawings that you see on top were actually made by the Dutch in the 1600s of a type of vessel called a veerschip, which was a, a ferry. And below that, you can see the construction of my digital model of the ferry, and then kind of ultimately uh, the way I finished it off uh, with uh, planking and a sail. And you'll see this vessel in some of the paintings. This is uh, Van Curler and his uh, bark. 
And this would have been before there were uh, sophisticated uh, box structures built. This is the way that Europeans would handle loading and offloading vessels in the Hudson River. The Hudson River is tidal. Uh, the tide rises by six, uh, by six feet. Um, so what they would do with their, their ships is they would run them into the shallow water at high tide. When the tide went out, uh, it would beach the vessel and then using boards or planks or whatever to cover the muddy bottom, they'd make their way out to the vessel and they would load or offload cargo. In this painting, you can see that that's being done by a small group here, but it also includes slaves. Um, and uh, slaves would have been pretty common both in the upper part of the Hudson Valley as well as the area around Manhattan. This is a scene uh, near uh, Yonkers, New York. Um, and uh, what you see here is that uh, Veer ship, the, the uh, Dutch ferry uh, that you saw in model form. This is a galliot, uh, another type of small craft used by the Dutch. This particular one was called the Amstel. Um, and it was constructed for use mostly on the Delaware River, but it would have made journeys from the Delaware River to the Hudson River in open seawater. Um, this is a fantastic little watercolor that was made by Auguste Hermann uh, around 1640. He, he was at the time in Manhattan and he made this sketch of the waterfront of Manhattan uh, basically as a, a plea for resources from uh, the Netherlands. Um, the condition of the fort was very poor. I don't know if you can see in the background, but the windmill only has uh, two blades um, and it's in generally fairly bad condition. Uh, a lot of these wooden structures here are starting to uh, collapse. From this uh, illustration that was made by Hermann, uh, a number of other artists started to stylize this. So a lot of times when you look at woodcuts and images of Manhattan in the 17th century, they've taken this scene and just improved it. Um, the idea was to try to encourage people to uh, uh, immigrate uh, to the New World. But Hermann's is the next best thing we have to some kind of contemporary image of very early Manhattan. We also have this document. This is an incredible document. This is a, a map, sort of a map, uh, that was drawn by Jacques Cortelieu uh, of the tip of Manhattan in the 1600s. And it's been drawn and redrawn a number of times. And in Stokes iconography, there's a very good um, version of the, this, this map is called the Castello Plan. The original is still in Italy, in Florence, in um, a library there. I was using uh, this map as my primary reference for a number of paintings, a series of paintings that I did of Manhattan in the 17th century. And one of the problems with this uh, drawing, the Castello drawing, is that when you look at it um, carefully, you can see that it's not a plan view. In other words, you're not looking straight down on it. You're looking at it from an angle, um, which is great for seeing the fenestration on buildings like, you know, stairs and windows and pilasters and roof lines. It's terrific for that. But you you can't lay this, trace this out and lay it on modern Manhattan. It just won't work because it's distorted. So the first step in trying to do any paintings of Manhattan was to reconfigure this so that um, um, so that it was useful, so that it was in scale. So to do that, I kind of searched for an early street map that was done uh, with uh, professional instruments. 
And what I found was the tip of Manhattan drawn around the 1880s. And my hope was that somewhere in this part of lower Manhattan, that this street pattern would somehow echo what uh, was being depicted on the 17th century Castello plan. So I kind of reoriented it. The green line here is Wall Street. I did an overlay of it. And in this overlay, this is a direct uh, drawing from the Costello plan. And you can see that um, uh, the streets um, line up somewhat. Um, actually, those two are backwards. This is the Castello plan. You can see how far off this is. And you can see that I've, re I've redone it so that it's more accurate. And from that, I did a, uh, I began a digital model. Now this was some years ago. This model was fairly crude compared to the models that I can build now, but um, I placed the windmill, I placed the fort, um, I put in a suggestion of the land mass and the houses, but from this very simple model, as I rotate and reposition myself, I could get to a point, even with these crude buildings, where I could see this as a real place. So I made a number of sketches. Uh, this is the strand. And then again, from the aerial view, I was able to do a more sophisticated painting. And you can see how rotating this down, the model, led to that uh, painting of Manhattan in 1660. Now, it's changed a bit from the Hermann time. I've kind of improved the windmill. The fort is a bit better. The old early wooden structures, some of them have been removed, but some of them are still there. And you can see that there's a, a different sort of Manhattan that's starting to crop up here. These are better buildings. They're made from brick. Uh, they have tiled roofs. And you can see that this community is evolving and becoming more sophisticated and more active. Um, from that model, I've made a number of paintings, many paintings. Um, this is a view of the East River. This is the location of a view that I made of uh, Hanover Square. Uh, this is a view of the Strand. And this is a kind of an overview looking at the tip of Manhattan, which today would be a view from the Brooklyn Bridge looking toward Bayonne, New Jersey. Um, if you were on the bridge and you were looking in this direction, the Statue of Liberty would be out here. Of course, all of this has been filled in much more, but this is the beginning of Wall Street over here. And uh, there's the, uh, uh, the mill on, on the Hudson River on the other side of the island. This is a painting that was commissioned by the Minnesota uh, Marine Art Museum. It's also, it's currently on exhibit at the Albany Institute exhibition. And these are others that were done from that same uh, digital model that I made of uh, the Costello plan. This is along the East River. Um, and this is sort of rounding the tip with the fort and the windmill there. The Dutch colony was under stress, tremendous stress. Uh, the English had settled in Massachusetts and the English <clears throat> had a successful settlement in Virginia. The French were in Canada, in Quebec. All of these pressures uh, came to bear on the, the Dutch colony. Um, Peter Stuyvesant at the time was the uh, was in command of the uh, colony and um, Stuyvesant was in charge of the fort uh, Fort Amsterdam I've been able to kind of uh, work backwards from what the English left behind to calculate approximate the the Dutch fort uh, this is uh, part was part of that study um, but a lot can be learned just from reading the correspondence that Stuyvesant was having with the company in the Netherlands. He was often 
and over and over again asking for help, for resources, that the fort that he had um, might be something that could be uh, useful in protecting against an attack of, uh, from the, uh, uh, the Indians, but it would never stand up to an attack from uh, European arms. It was in terrible condition. He writes about pigs uh, digging away the, uh, the parapet, uh, the earth from the uh, side walls of the fort um, to such a state that um, uh, these walls were collapsing. They were, they were gouged away. Um, in an effort to prevent any further decay, uh, he tried to wall off uh, the earthworks here to keep the livestock out of there, but he was relatively unsuccessful. So the, this is, these are drawings that I made from uh, those studies. Uh, this fort was in such poor condition that an attacking army wouldn't have to do much more. You could get in and out of the fort by walking through the walls. That's, that's, how, that's how poor a uh, state this fort was in. And um, Stuyvesant's uh, requests went unheeded, and um, uh, the English were very aware of the success of the colony and uh, the value of Manhattan. And so um, uh, there was a, a time when um, uh, it, it became uh, serious enough that uh, uh, Stuyvesant wouldn't be able to defend it. This is uh, the Delaware River. I'm gonna go back one. This is the Delaware River over here. Stuyvesant felt that uh, this needed to be protected. Now, if you can think back to that earlier uh, slide that showed the beaver here in Western New York, as the colony uh, expanded and grew, this area and this area became less productive in terms of fur, but this was still a rich place to trade. Stuyvesant understood that he could control the Hudson River because man of the location of Manhattan and he could thereby control the Mohawk River. But if he lost control of the Delaware River, there was an access for an enemy to get to the heart of the fur trade. So he built a fort here, Fort Casimir. Um, he couldn't take care of it. And for a short time, the Delaware River was taken over by the Swedes. Um, they held it for a time. Stuyvesant was able to take it back. Uh, the Swedes had built a larger fort, uh, Fort Christina. Uh, fort Casimir had fallen into ruin. Stuyvesant had come back. He had rebuilt uh, Casimir and basically cut off the Swedes from their fort um, and had sort of very loose control over the, the uh, Delaware uh, river. That fort was a real mess. I mean, it was the, uh, the Dutch can't take care of it. The Swedes tried to improve it, um, but their records indicate that it's, it's basically a lost cause. Um, they had created a plan for building a better defense here, um, but it, um, uh, it was never really implemented. So when um, Charles II gives James, the Duke of York, permission uh, to come to the New World and take New Netherland from the Dutch, make it an English settlement, um, he arrives in Manhattan with his Marines and his warships. And Stuyvesant, knowing that he has no real way to defend the city, surrenders. So Manhattan becomes English. But down here on the Delaware River, there was a semi-corrupt commandant in charge of this fort, Fort uh, Casimir. And he decides that uh, uh, because of his connections with the English in the uh, black market trading of tobacco, that he could convince 
the invading force, that he should stay in charge. Uh, unlike Stuyvesant, who gave up Manhattan, he should be remain in control of uh, the Delaware River and Fort Casimir. Well, the English sees things differently. Um, his name was uh, uh, Pinota. He resists and uh, the British take that fort uh, by force. And um, with those last cannon shots, uh, New Netherland is now entirely under uh, English control. But the Dutch influence, even though it was relatively short, it didn't last a century, um, their influence continued uh, long after the English takeover. Uh, this is a painting that I made of um, Claverack Landing, which becomes Hudson, New York. And this is set in the 1760s. This is a, the, the English take the colony in 1664. So this is a hundred years later, this community is still not only Dutch, but it's a Dutch speaking community. This whole area of the Hudson River is still speaking Dutch. Uh, and that continues um, even at, by the time that the Quakers come in the 1680s and they buy this place, they're from New Bedford and they turn it into a whaling port. But right across the river is the small town of Athens. And at the same time that English was being spoken here in uh, uh, Hudson, um, the people who lived in Athens were still speaking Dutch. So what is the legacy of the Dutch? Well, New York is still quite different than New England. That's probably one thing that's very noticeable to anybody that travels in this part of the world. But also language. Um, I once uh, gave a program similar to this to a bunch of elementary school kids, and I said, what do you call that? And they all said, that's a pit. And I said, well, that's not English. The English people call that a stone. Pit is Dutch. And there are many, many, many hundreds, thousands of words in the English language, the American English, English language, that basically are Dutch, uh, Dutch words, including Santa Claus. Dollar is a Dutch word. Uh, their architectural style um, became a little bit more romanticized, but the step gables that were prominent in Europe, in Amsterdam, you see those all over New York. These, these photographs are taken in Albany. That's a firehouse that was built in the 1900s, but very Dutch in style. And you see it in apartment buildings. You see it everywhere. And you see glorious examples of it. But you also see ridiculous examples of it. Um, this, this notion that there is a past and that it connects to the Netherlands, um, I think will remain with us here in New York for some time to come. And so at the end of the program, I thought I would point out a few things. I don't know how many people are familiar with the open, uh, the, the flag that's used for stores that are open. If you take a look at that flag and you think about it, that's a Dutch flag. And I thought I'd close the program today with this uh, sunset view of the tip of Manhattan and the end of an era. And that brings uh, part two of the series to an end and hopefully um, we'll be here again in about a month with part three. All right. <laughs> how was it, how was it watching yourself, oh. listening to yourself, uh, Len? Oh my God, there was like, there's at least five major mistakes in there and uh, uh, which are driving me crazy. But um, um, a couple that come to mind is I know that Tim uh, McCormick is watching, and Tim has a special interest in the painting Curiosity of the Magua, and I identified that bark incorrectly as belonging to Vanderdonk when it belonged to Van Curler, so that's on my mind. <laughs> um, and the Quakers that bought uh, Claverack Landing and then built um, Hudson, New York, are, were not from New Bedford, they were from Nantucket. 
and I'm not going to go into any of the other ones, uh, but uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. I, I think we can forgive you for some of those. Um, if anybody has any questions uh, for Lynn, please feel free to uh, type them in the chat box. Um, if there's anybody uh, who would like to even unmute themselves and maybe ask a question, please feel free to do so as well. Um, what do you, I mean, I guess in terms of when you take some of those two dimensional images, what do you, into three dimensional uh, views, what do you find most challenging about that? Uh, well, um, I find those maps so fascinating uh, because this is a uh, person who is living in that time and um, sometimes without very sophisticated tools conveying information about a place. So it, it might be the cove of a river or the location of a mill or um, just it can be anything. And when I study those maps and I see those details, I start to wonder, I mean, they attract me. It makes me uh, think that there's a potential painting there. And I think that's what kind of gets me, that's what gets me going. Plus, you know, I have a network of, of friends who are, you know, experts who are great historians. And I get stories from them. I get stories from Charlie Gehring and Paul Huey and Dennis Micah and I can, uh, Steve Belinsky, I can go on and on and on. Um, but they, those stories inspire me. And then there's discoveries that come along the way. I'm, I'm doing some research on one thing and I'll find a storyline that takes me somewhere else. So I make a note of that and, and um, you know, put it aside. And that kind of goes into the uh, bin of possible ideas for painting. So. That, the great thing about painting a um, uh, historical record is that uh, I can do a lot of different things with it. I, I can, it, it takes me into uh, a village of um, Mohicans or it takes me aboard uh, a ship in the 17th century. And I kind of, it feels like a, a bit of a time machine. See, we have quite a few questions that just came in. Um, are, do you know if Quonset huts are derived from longhouses? Uh, I don't know if they're derived directly, but there's the arch shape. And uh, so you still see it today and you see it in all kinds of things, but a Quonset hut's a direct uh, translation of that, uh, of using that arch form for uh, a stable uh, uh, shelter or building. Yeah, um, also that, the you know, in that ancient primitive world that um, uh, where those people discovered the, the aeronautical aspect of that kind of curvature, you, that's what you see in the fuselages of airplanes, um, the same sort of um, technology. Well, it's not made out of bark, but. <laughs> Do your books describe Manhattan uh, with your paint paintings in a similar way? Um, the, the book Edge of New Netherland, which is mostly about the Delaware River, there's quite a bit in that book about the construction of forts. Um, the um, most recent book, The um, A Sense of Time, also gets into it, but I think A Sense of Time is more about the paintings, more about the artwork, um, although there's a, a number of great essays in there um, by some of the people who I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, uh, not as much as what we just saw in that uh, in that video. Not not at that level of um, of detail. Uh, there's a question about the uh, es escape of the Jesuit, um, and it, if there is any nexus between uh, that painting and Saint Isaac Jacques, uh, or what was the source for the painting, and where is the painting today? Um, uh, the, well, the painting was in a is in a private collection, and that is Father Isaac Jogues. Um, and um, for uh, people who have visited the Ori's, Orisville Shrine, um, that's the shrine to uh, the Jesuit. Um, yeah, it's uh, his his words are really interesting um, because um, 
Well, he wasn't very impressed with his stay in uh, in uh, Fort Orange. I mean, first of all, he had been badly uh, uh, tortured, but um, and I don't think his accommodations were great because the Dutch were very when they hid him out. I think he was here for several months. Um, he he was hidden somewhere by the Domini. Um, and um, so his accommodations must have been pretty terrible. But over that amount of time, you know, he, he wrote about what he saw. So he uh, he's not particularly kind in his description. He calls Fort Orange a wretched little fort made of logs. So at least we know it was made out of wood and uh, it wasn't the best fort in the world. But Jobes would have been familiar with uh, European forts that were much more substantial and, um, you know, maintained much better so so yeah that's I, I try to build some of that grit into the into the paintings I, I, I think uh, when I first started out I was a little bit more idealistic about what they might be and over time um, they're getting grungier and grungier just like I am uh, have you reached out to modern Haudenosaunee or Mohican communities to get additional information or verification uh, or updating some of your work? I haven't, I haven't worked with the uh, Mohawks very much, but um, I have had contact with the Mohicans and, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm very, um, I'm kind of aware that um, I don't understand Indian culture. I don't I don't understand what their um, religious beliefs were or um, um, how they considered family relationships. I don't I, I don't know that part of their life. What I what I what I try to do is, as I mentioned in the, the video, I try to kind of build into it uh, something that I believe is um, common to all people. And um, but I. Uh, one of the things that um, the um, Stockport Muncie, um, who were out, they've been displaced so many times. They, they were the Mohicans that started in the Hudson Valley. Um, and uh, after the English takeover, they get pushed into Massachusetts, into the Stockbridge area, and eventually get completely displaced and are now in Wisconsin. Uh, but, um, um, I was honored uh, when um, they um, acquired uh, my a uh, couple of my paintings to be displayed there uh, in you know, on in one of the uh, one of their civic buildings there. So um, yeah, that that made me feel pretty good. It made me feel like uh, I wasn't creating something that was um, um, unpleasant, you know, or uh, insulting or something like that. I would never want to do that. Uh, Edwin, Edwin asked if we know what the church in the fort looked like. Uh, the church in the fort in Manhattan? Yeah, uh, um, I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's either uh, Fort Amsterdam or Fort Orange. No, it's Fort Amsterdam. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, we do know what that fort looks like because one of the great things that um, uh, maps can um, can tell us, uh, and one of the things that uh, contemporaneous documents can tell us is, and I always look for this, um, if you see something depicted uh, in a specific way done by a particular cartographer, and some time goes by, and and a completely different person who is not related to that first map draws the same thing. We have corroborative information. So that odd roof that it has, this, it's a, a double um, gable, <laughs> which is not a great roof, really. I mean, when you think about it, buildings that are built like that have lots of water problems because they're shedding water off the sides, but because it's a double gable, sort of a shape of an M, the, the center part is draining water right into the middle of the building. So you have to still get it out of there. So it's, it's, it's a design that it was just, it's just kind of doomed uh, from the start. But we see that double gable in the uh, uh, Castello plan. Um, and then we see it later um, in um, other, uh, other drawings of, uh, 
of uh, Manhattan. So I'm positive that that church looked something like that. Uh, Tim McCormick asked, uh, how long does it typically take from beginning research to finish painting, like your painting of uh, Dutch New York City? Um, well, first, the first go around, you know, before I built the model, um, it was a while because I spent like probably, um, it, this, it isn't uncommon for me to spend two or three months researching something like that. And, um, uh, and then, you know, by the time I get to painting it, it's, I've got a really good idea of what it is. So that maybe the first painting of Manhattan might have taken four months. Uh, but then some of those other views, less time because I, I'm, uh, I'm aware of how things are lining up. Um, but my model building is changing too. So the models are becoming a little bit more detailed than before. And, and I change my mind about things. I, I, I learn something new about uh, an area and I try to incorporate that. So. I would the, the longest I've ever worked on a painting was one that I did for KeyBank, which now belongs uh, to the Omni Corporation. Um, and that painting is in its frame is 10 feet long. And that took me a year to paint and I didn't work on anything else except that one project. Uh, George asked, do I remember correctly that you discovered that the Dutch also used the position of the blades of a windmill to message ships at sea? Uh, well, they use the, the uh, blades of a windmill um, uh, generally um, for, um, to express various things, celebration, mourning, danger. Um, and I don't remember all the positions, but if you look up online, uh, uh, positioning a windmill, windmill blades to express uh, some feelings, you'll find those things. Now I did a, well, this painting isn't, well, I don't, yeah, I think the painting is in, it's in the book, uh, A Sense of Time, and it's also in the exhibition at the Institute. Um, I did a painting of uh, Manhattan uh, for a client whose family owned a portion of the property that was eventually occupied by the World Trade Center. And so um, he requested that when I, when I painted that windmill that I uh, positioned the blades in the position of mourning because of their sighting near the South Tower. Casey asked, yes. what do you find as the best resource for maps during the 1600 to 1800 period? Um, well, if starting backwards from the 1800s, you can find lots of stuff. I mean, everywhere. Library of Congress is a good place to go. Um, but there are museums um, around the country that have now uh, scanned their, uh, their maps and you can get, get at them online. Uh, Boston Public Library has a pretty good collection. Um, um, and I, I, they have very high resolution maps. Um, the problem when you get way back, like uh, like uh, the like the period of the Dutch, especially the period of the Dutch, is that um, there was a disaster that took place in the early 1900s. Um, for centuries, the Dutch documents had been kept in a secure location, and I can't remember where it was. It might have been a library, but I'm not sure. Uh, but they decided that for safekeeping, they would take all the original Dutch documents from the 17th century that had been preserved for so long and move them to the new New York State Capitol building, which they did. Well, the Capitol building caught fire and more than half of those documents were destroyed. So there are, there's information that is uh, lost for all time. And another curious thing about uh, that era is that the Dutch were pretty good at documenting things and they were all over the globe. So you find paintings of uh, botanical materials and buildings and forts uh, from other places that they were. But uh, so far, none have really turned up. 
that depict the Hudson Valley or the uh, Manhattan or, or um, uh, Albany area. Um, who knows why? I mean, I've heard there's a story that um, when the English took over, those, those materials were collected and were in transit and the ship that they were being carried on was lost at sea. I, I don't know if that really happened, but I, I do know this, that those documents are pretty scarce. Uh, Carol asks, can you discuss with us your mastery of the use of light in your paintings, light on water, light through sails, light at dusk, in the dawn, et cetera, et cetera? Mastery makes me nervous. <laughs> um, I do it, but um, yeah, uh, I, one of the reasons why I play with light like that is um, I'm tr what I'm what I've learned from painting is that um, if you want to get someone's attention, you ha you only ha a painter, an artist uh, who produces a work uh, on canvas or paper, you only have uh, fractions of a second to capture somebody's attention. If you, if you go to a museum and you just watch people walk through the museum, you'll see them walk past, I, I've done this, I've watched them walk past a number of paintings, but then stop. And so I wonder, what is it about that one painting that caused a number of people to pause there and look at it? And it usually has to do with uh, the light. It has to do with the light creating an emotional effect. And so if I want to portray a historical um, event, the first thing I, I feel that I need to do is get your attention. And to get your attention, I try to do that with some kind of um, color or composition or lighting that will make you first interested in what is this? And um, then when you get by that part, then that's when I can tell you a bit of a story about the characters or the place or the event. So I use a emotional, uh, that, that tool um, as a device to get people um, to um, um, learn a little bit about uh, who we are, where we came from. Uh, a question I can answer quick. Uh, Rick asked if we could, if we'll be able to watch this presentation again. And yes, the, the presentation has been recorded. Um, I will do some touch-up editing and it will be made available on the Albany Institute website and uh, YouTube site in about two to three weeks. So yes, you will be able to watch the presentation uh, again. Um, Leslie asked, uh, or not, not, it wasn't, didn't ask, just a comment. She said, thank you, Len. The power of your historical art powerfully thank demonstrates you. a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and Edward, Edward, Edwin asked, did cartographer Wilhelm Blau make maps of uh, New Amsterdam? Um, I don't think, I can't, uh, I can't say, I'm not that, I'm not familiar with, um, with those maps. I, I, maybe, maybe I've seen them and I don't associate them with that name, but it, it's not uh, ringing a bell. The, the, the uh, prominent names are in the, uh, the guys that I really um, uh, refer to the most, the Cortel, Cortel U um, New, um, Manhattan one is really important, but another great cartographer, I think we'll see more uh, of uh, his work in part three was um, an English um, surveyor. He was, he was also a soldier, he was a colonel. His name was Wolfgang Romer. And he made maps of Albany and Schenectady, and um, they're very, very accurate, and uh, so accurate that they don't need to be corrected. You can take a Romer map and you can put it on uh, on that place now, and you can it'll it'll line up with the streets. So, yeah. So those are a few. There's pro there's probably many. Oh, <laughs> there's another one that um another map maker, probably the most unusual one. Um, so we're, we're, when you talk, when you think about the 16th, 17th century, um, early 18th century, all the cartographers are men, except for one. Um, and um, she was a great cartographer. 
Um, I, don't, I don't know what her first name was, but her last name was Buckner. And she made a map of Manhattan in the 17, the like 1730, 40, 50, somewhere in that time frame. Um, a great map, which I've used for uh, for a couple of paintings. And uh, someone asked me once, "How do you know this map was made by Mrs. Buckner?" Well, because it's called the Mrs. Mrs. Buckner's map. But I said she wrote her name right here, Mrs. Buckner. So. Mrs. Buckner was a pretty good cartographer. So, yeah. So there's a, there's stories behind those maps that are as interesting as the maps themselves. Well, that looks like the last uh, question that has come through. But there are many uh, positive comments. Uh, Chris Miles said, "Appreciate all your details. Worth missing the sunny day outside for sure." There's many thank yous, amazing Len. Um, there are many, many, uh, a wonderful presentation. So uh, we are coming up at just about 3.30. So I do wanna be mindful of everybody's time and hopefully uh, for everybody who can enjoy some of the nice weather, I want to make sure we have time this afternoon. So Len, I want to thank you for your presentation this afternoon um, and look forward to part three, which I can announce will be on Sunday, April 18th. Uh, also at 2 p.m. Um, so registration for that third part will go up uh, this week. So we are certainly welcome, uh, welcome. looking forward to uh, having you again for our next uh, segment in the series. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Today. We loved it, Lynn. <laughs> Thanks, CW. It was thank awesome. You. <laughs> your artwork and your presentation, man, was uh, so fascinating. <laughs> Thanks, CW. You're, Hi, awesome. You're an awesome dude, man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, uh, if you if you feel like it, to email me because I'd I'd like to uh, read the comments. So um, uh, it's lftantillo at uh, gmail .com. And thank you for uh, participating. Yes, See you next. yes, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, I hope you have a, a great rest of your afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you're joining us from. Um, thank you everybody. And we'll do the virtual round of applause. Thank, so you, thank, you, thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.